Hey everybody, welcome back to The Network Effect, the show where we open up our little black book and introduce you to some of the greatest investors and entrepreneurs scaling businesses around the world. We're really excited to be back for episode eight. Time's flying by with all the episodes and as you may notice, the team's also growing. So I'd like to introduce a, a, a new person to the team, Gina, welcome. Hi guys, thanks yeah. for having me, good to be here. No problem. We thought we'd just do a quick little intro to Gina really to kick off today before we get into the usual show. So. Gina, why don't you tell us a little bit of your background before you uh, arrived with the Century team? Cool. Hi, guys. My name is Gina. I'm from Cape Town, South Africa, originally, but I've been living in and out of London for the last three and a half years. I spent the pandemic back home because um, I got stuck there, so I was stuck in Cape Town, which was not a bad place to be. Um, but I'm now back in London and with the Century team, which I'm so excited about. I was previously in a medical and security as assistance and advisory company. Uh, doing a lot of travel risk management, so I know a lot about the global expansion world, but it's really good to be on the other side of it and to be joining the Centurion team. So and girl power, finally! Woo! Finally! finally. <laughs> it's so good yeah, to be here exactly. and to actually exciting. meet the team because I've seen so much of you guys on, on LinkedIn and on the other side of the screen. So And the funny thing is, we hadn't seen you when we recruited you and when we met you. Gosh, she's six foot tall, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that was the shock to the sister. <laughs> so, yeah, so not only is she six foot tall, but the entire team is six foot tall. Or yeah, six foot tall. <laughs> so I'm the tiny person amongst all of them. I think we're about one person short of a basketball team. Yeah, we're getting <laughs> <laughs> this entire basketball team. Is coming. Oh, absolutely. If there's, any, if there's any partners out there that want to form a team and compete against come us here in, in London, come in. Um, so yeah, well, I, I guess just uh, quickly, what, what's, what are you excited about for uh, for the Centuro team? And, and yeah, what with us? I think it's actually just joining the team. Everyone here is so experienced, so ambitious, and it's just such a lively and fun energy to be around. So really happy to be here and to be joining the company. Um, I think also just the work that they're doing and you know how Centuro really is going to disrupt the space and it's, it's just a game changer for me. So to be, to be here and to see their passion and to be part of that is really inspiring. So very happy to be here. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you on board. Gina will be joining us for some of the different segments we have coming up planned for the network effect as well. So the formula will always be a little bit different. Um, today we're bringing you the next edition of the Great Country Debate. So we're currently all tied up, Siraj, Zane and I, one, one at piece. So today will be the big tiebreaker with a, with a new little element of... Um, it's not suspense. Yeah, bring, bring in a new little element. So stay tuned for that. Um, but to kick us off, I guess, as usual, Asma, you've got an amazing interview today. Absolutely. And every week we kind of excel ourselves with finding, you know, new guests, which uh, continue to inspire me. Yeah. So me that's too. like any other week. And this week we've got another amazing guest, a uh, pair of guests that are coming on and joining us shortly. Fantastic. Well, I guess without further ado, we'll uh, get to the interview. Yeah. OK, so today, everyone... Hi everybody, hi, hi, welcome guys, welcome to the show. I was supposed to do a very short introduction there for you, but we cut to the uh, cut to the credits very fast, but anyway, that happens on live. So just basically wanted to give a little bit of background to the audience, everyone that's watching. So guys, I've got Forecast Technologies here, uh, a company based in Copenhagen, Denmark, founded back in 2016. So a startup in many ways, but have the rapid growth that you, you guys have had over the last five years, it doesn't feel like I'm talking to a startup, but still, you know, we'll t ask you more about that in a short time. So you've developed a product which is AI driven, which promises to actually improve and, and uh, project management and professional services and make it more efficient. So we'll learn a little bit more about what the product does in a short time. But as with anything, we all get really excited about technology and, and software and development in many ways. But I think what we always forget is behind this technology that's evolving and disrupting the space, 
There is a human behind it. There are humans behind it. People with a purpose, people with a passion, and people with an impact and trying to change the way things are done. And I think that's what we probably forget. We get excited by what's out there and what's innovating. But actually, the most, most important fact about this is the people and the, how the idea comes about and, and you know, what happens with that. So today, I am really, really happy to be joined by the founder and the CTO of Forecast Technologies. So welcome, Dennis, and welcome, Damantha. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you for being on the show. <laughs> really looking forward to talking to you both. So I'm going to kick off, Dennis, with you, really. Um, so you started your company five years ago, and I'm sure you had a vision at the time. Um, so have you accomplished the vision that you set out to achieve five years ago, or is that still yet to be achieved in the coming years? Uh, so first of all, I'll say amazing intro video, like good stuff on <laughs> building that. You know, that was, that was pretty no cool. problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll have my marketing team reach out to you to get that. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, you know, with, with a thing like this, uh, you can kind of think of where you, like, uh, think this will go and, and kind of where you, like, are hoping it to go, right? And I think uh, we're on a, on, a, on a very, very good path on, on getting to the kind of end vision, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it will take a while to get there, right? So, yeah. you know, Samantha and I kind of runs the entire technology, right? And, and what we're trying to build here is not trivial. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of kind of technical challenges in, and getting this right, right, and making sure that it works, mm -hmm. um, and and that's you know making very, very you know good headwind and good good steep steep progress. But uh, at the same time, there's still there's still you know some time to go, right? Yeah, no, I completely understand. So, Dennis, I always like to understand really motivations and, and understand really the passion behind the founder and where this idea started. So, I wanted to see whether I can get inside your head really a little bit, <laughs> you know, in, in mentally and try and kind of understand that moment, that light bulb moment. Sometimes you see it in the movies where, you know, you can see this, this lights clicking off and someone has this idea and they, it, it sort of develops into something. When did that happen for you and when did this idea come up and, and what did you do next? Sure. So um, I have a, a background in computer science, so mm -hmm. you know, pretty technical kind of by nature. But um, I, uh, I'll, I'll give you like the short, the short version of the story. But um, I, uh, I moved to the U.S. and and by by luck or chance, I ended up uh, starting to work for the small web development uh, company in in Los Angeles, and um, building basically e-commerce sites. So this was you know before right right around the time that you know Shopify and those those guys got started. Uh, so we're still kind of building sites for when they build customers and, and things like that. And I, and I got this job, uh, basically started as an intern, um, as this web development agency and a couple of months in, I think it was, um, our boss came out and he said, guys, we're you know, going to stop building websites. We're going to build an e-commerce engine instead. Um, and you know, I think a couple of days later we started building that, uh, and that was, a, a an, uh, e-commerce engine called uh, Magento Commerce. Um, so. I think I was like one of the first four developers uh, working on, on the first version of that. That kind of led me uh, back to Europe where I got a job uh, with IBM and through various means uh, ended up being um, kind of one of the main responsibles for the e-commerce practice of IBM in the Nordics. Uh, and then through that actually getting to work on a very, very large scale project for a, a very large uh, furniture retailer uh, um, in, in the Nordics and, and through there really seeing some of the challenges uh, that are inherent in delivering complex work with a lot of people uh, mm -hmm. where you're trying to build something where you don't necessarily know off the bat what you're trying to achieve. Um, and, and, and the big pain point of that, I would say one of the big pain points of that was that we were managing everything in a very large spreadsheet. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is very common for most of our customers that come in, they will be managing work, they'll be managing their people, they'll be managing their priorities and all this, the things that they need to work on in, in a combination of spreadsheets and disparate systems. Um, so that was kind of the, the, the core idea for the building, really get rid of that, that whole kind of spreadsheet exercise that most people are going on a daily basis. Um, so really wanting to relieve that pain uh, because it is a huge pain and, and no one wants to really do manual updates and, and really you know, boring admin work people want to work on interesting tasks, right? Work with people and, and things like that, right? And really, what we're really trying to do is, is sort of do that uh, with, with the product we're building. Yeah, now, it's really interesting because I actually mentored a project for young um, sixth form girls. They were doing a, a project 
on technology and AI, and I, I spent a lot of time with a whole group of them trying to understand what automation means for them and for the next generation of, um, uh, I guess, young people, uh, in this case females, of going into the industry and what is AI and how is it going to replace and should they be fearful of the prospects that they have in the future. And what was interesting is their understanding of technology, the fact that they didn't realize it actually has exist, existed for centuries. And so everything that we're doing now and everything that's being innovated now is an evolution of how we progress as a society, I think. And so it's interesting that how we are still in the, you know, kind of the 21st century, we are still inventing and improving and, and bringing in new ideas of how to make processes efficient. So that's why I'm kind of really fascinated by the product that you have. And so I guess I'm going to come to Demantha now. So, Damantha, you joined the company um, uh, recently, is that right? So, can, just, yeah. just wanted to ask you really, just tell us a little bit about your background. You're a CTO, I know, but a little bit about you um, and why you joined Forecast. Yeah, so I've, I've got about 25 years of uh, experience building commercial software products. Uh, I started in a large American software company and then I went to a, a small startup and then went to a large Danish company and then went to another small startup and then I... Uh, just before I joined uh, Forecast, I was at a large uh, company again doing life and pension, life insurance and pension software, uh, right? So enterprise scale stuff. And then I decided to join Forecast because uh, I was very attracted to the speed at which we were doing things, the agility, the fact that I felt that I could really produce something and, 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 and get it out there and feel that I was making a meaningful contribution. Um, I really liked the technology, I liked the idea. I like the people, right? So it was just a good fit. And I think at, at, at heart, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm kind of an entrepreneur at heart, right? And uh, just just that whole journey uh, mm -hmm. is just super exciting for me. So that was that was one of the main reasons that I, uh, that I joined. And I really like the product. And, and for me, project, working in software for 25 years, uh, especially doing management, it's all about project management, mm -hmm. right? Even mm -hmm. you're doing software, you know, standard software, it's all small, small projects that go along, right? So, so it's a, it's a it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart, and I can see that they were doing a good job uh, with it, right? So, I wanted to jump on. Yeah, no, so I, I look at CTOs, and I don't know whether this is just my perception, but I see CTOs as superheroes, right? They're the superhero of the build and of the company, and they are the front line of what the product is about. It, you know, the success or the failure of a product depends on the CTO. Am I right, or is this my perception? <laughs> I think that's, uh, I, I, uh, it's, a, it's, it's very nice that you say that, but I, I think that's probably blowing things a bit out of proportion, also in, in terms of uh, it's, it's a, from my perspective, a big uh, point of what I need to do is make sure that that everybody else is successful, not that I'm. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and it depends on the scale and the size, right? So mm -hmm. when it's three guys, right, in the in the basement, right, uh, uh, then then that makes a difference, right? I mean, uh, then then you got to then you're this then you're the hero. Sorry, my lights just gone off. That's okay. Space. And then um, when you're when you're three guys. You got to be this uh, superhero and do, doing a bunch of things, but as you grow, it, it's the natural progression where it's more about getting your team to perform than it is about you to perform, right? And of course, setting some new direction and keeping the people aligned, right? But but uh, it's like anything; it needs to evolve. The the role evolves mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. with, with the company, right? And, and and the stages, right? Brilliant. Okay, so coming back to you, Dennis, you've got this idea, you've gone out, you've decided you're going to set up this company. Did you go out for funding immediately? Because again, I, I, I kind of sort of resonate with that and I look at lots of startups that approach us and, and you know, that I've worked with in the past. Some of them come with just an idea and then they start to go for funding. But in your circumstances, did you do that? Did you go out for investment early? Is that the right thing to do? Uh, it would be good to share your kind of understanding on that. Yeah, sure. Um, so no, we actually didn't do that in the beginning. I mean, initially I was, I'll, I'll say I was almost a little bit opposed to taking outside money uh, because I had this idea we could just do it by ourselves and we could kind of make that work. Um, but I think, I think what, what we realized was, you know, after we'd gotten kind of the first handful of customers on and, and we could really start like seeing that there was some traction in, in, in what we're building, um, we could we could kind of quickly see that you know if, if we had gone that path that that could have been a, a viable path, uh, but we just really couldn't move at the pace we wanted to right. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you know VC money is 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 one of the, one of the pathways to to mm -hmm. accelerate 
um, both the company growth and also what we can do in terms of building product, right? Um, so I think we, we could have not moved as fast as we're doing without external financing. Uh, but I think for, for people that are considering taking venture capital, um, you know, there are, there are a few things that, that I'd like to kind of help people be mindful of. And that's, you know, what you kind of get on that journey, you can't really get off, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're on that train, right? And that train <laughs> is running and you have to just kind of move with it, right? You can't jump off because you'll die on the way, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, absolutely. It's really, a, it's really a, a, a choice that you have to make wisely, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think for some people, that's great. I think in our case, it's been absolutely correct. Uh, I think for some people, it's not great, right? And you have not great outcomes, right? So I think from that perspective, um, you know, just, just a thing to be mindful of. And also, like, are you building something that can actually be scaled massively, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's another thing that people tend to forget. So they're like, they see this lion's den and stuff on the, on TV, right? And they like, all right, I have this idea, you know, I'll go raise, you know, $100 million and, and mm -hmm. do something, right? And it's, it's not really often that simple and, and easy to do. So when you guys were going out to funding, so had you proved, had you, did you have traction then? And did you sort of kind of have revenue generating? And I guess it's a, it's a much more easier conversation to have. And during that process, I mean, what were the challenges that you found with the funding rounds? I, I think the, the I, think, I think today, especially, it will be challenging raising off a, just, a, just a PowerPoint or a slide, right? Yeah. Um, I, think, I think most VCs will, will expect to see some sort of traction. They will expect to see some sort of product. So the bar has definitely moved. I mean, it's also easier building products now than mm -hmm. it has been ever, right? So, so in that sense, it's that's become easier, but the other parts are becoming maybe a little bit harder, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I'll, I'll say it would not have been possible without having some traction, I'd say, right? Or it would have yeah. been yeah. vastly more different. different. Yeah. Of course. And Samantha, just coming to you, how important, because again, a lot of people have ideas and products. And I think quite often we, we're educated and we see things about, you know, CTOs are a really important part of product development and about technology. And how important is a CTO as part of your, your funding rounds and, and the investment process? I mean, do people have to have a CTO on board? And what would you advise? And were you part of the funding rounds? So just just your views on that. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, I think, uh... Uh, to, the biggest element is credibility, right? Do you bring credibility uh, to the table, right? Are you able to show that this is a, uh, somebody that you believe in, right, on the technology uh, front, right? So it's not necessarily about being able to um, uh, sort of exp explain it necessarily, be heavily involved in the negotiations. It's more about saying, okay, uh, is the team a good team? Because I think mm -hmm. what I've seen and heard is that the VCs, a big part of it, what they invest in is the team, right? It's the people, right? And whether or not your CTO is able to articulate uh, that, that, that kind of presence or uh, elicit the confidence in, in others that they're able to do the job. So, right? so I think that that's, that's uh, I think, the biggest thing. And of course, they need to subsequently execute on it. Right. Yeah. Um, but so, but of course, for sure, it's it, it's instrumental to making sure that the, that things are successful, especially especially as you go on the journey. So one thing is what you do when you're two two or three people. It's it's what happens after five yeah. years, yeah. After ten years, right? That you're still able to continue to to do that. And, and you guys have had rapid growth with growing your team and bringing in new talent and, and expanding at a fast rate. And I guess in this particular time, particularly, I mean, we would have thought the pandemic would have had some impact and there'd be more resources available, but actually it's had the opposite impact. There is a skills shortage. You can't find talent anywhere and talent is a big challenge. So how do you maintain and manage to bring in new talent and keep up with all of that? Because obviously when you've got funding and you are trying to scale at a very, very you know, fast rate, Talent is key to that. So, what are you doing? How I mean, how what are your experiences with talent? Are you finding it? Um, do you experience there is a shortage, and where do you look? Yeah, so I think it is very difficult to find good uh, good technical talent, and yeah, I think that there's uh, many people uh, out there uh, pulling on those uh, uh, those skilled uh, those skilled people. I think what we're trying to do is um, is is show to people that we have an interesting uh, product, an interesting place to work. Uh, and a modern approach, right? So that means that, you know, it's not necessarily, uh, you know, old school bureaucracy and rigor uh, that, that we have here, right? It's about that you have a say, right? That it's mm -hmm. fun to work here, right? That it's actually interesting um, that you're contributing, mm -hmm. right? So I think a lot of it is also the messaging to, uh, to the candidates, right? Uh, um, 
that that this is a good place to work and you know that's super easy to say right but there's a lot of stuff underneath that that means like your positioning you know just your website right does it is it old school is it something uh, uh, is it is it modern right uh, do you use technologies and processes that appeal to uh, uh, to people to software developers for example right is it, is it, it are you doing stuff in a, in a in a humane way right in mm. some ways right um, so it's a lot about the intangibles. So I think we've gone away from the, uh, do we have a ping pong table, uh, right? And do you have Friday beers uh, at your workplace, right? Or do you have casual Fridays, right? I mean, nobody, everybody does that, right? So I think it, what's, what's more important, I think, is that it's fundamentally a good and interesting place to work, right? You need to be mm -hmm. able to communicate that, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. In, a, in a super short way, right? Because people get inundated with, you know, Job offers, so there needs to be something where you, you are very clear on your uh, messaging about why it's good to work here, right? Mm -hmm. And, and uh, really highlight those things. Right? Yeah, that's that's brilliant. And so, Dennis, I mean, uh, you've obviously, again, uh, as a founder of this company, and I th I've known growing a company, building teams, right? And as you grow and you've got more and more people coming on board, how do you spread yourself across? all functionalities, how do you manage the growth journey yourself? Yeah, so it's, it's definitely a, a steep learning curve. Um, and as Dementa said, if you're like when you're two people or, or you know, mm -hmm. a few people starting out, uh, you know, you kind of have to do a little bit of everything, right? And as you kind of grow and you prove that you can, you can, you know, start sell stuff and, and, and build stuff, then, you know, you, you get opportunities to hopefully hire more people, right? If you have the finances to do so, right? And once you do that, then, you know, it's, it's always a matter of making sure you can find the best person you can at that given time. Mm -hmm. And that will, again, vary from stage to stage, right? So some of the people we're hiring now, we would have never been able to hire them, you know, when we started, right? Because first of all, we couldn't afford them. Second of all, we didn't have the appeal that we do now and a lot of other things, right? So those things kind of have to come step in step, right? And, and one of the main kind of things, so first of all, mainly my job is focused on two things. It's, you know, financing and it's it's people right so it's hiring people um, and those are basically the, the the two things I do more or less uh, all the time um, and for me it's really been about trying to level up the executive team I have that reports to me and making sure we find the best and most talented people um, to fit that, that that profile that what we need right so in this case Samantha joining us right uh, almost a year ago now mm -hmm. um, you know, very kind of really had some amazing candidates in that process right and, and really feel that like we, we got like the best person we could, right? Um, as an example, right? And, and trying to kind of do that across the board for, for the executives and then relying on them to build their teams under them, right? So really kind of making sure that you can delegate sufficiently, um, but also having trust in people uh, that they can actually do that, right? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll vet some of the, the candidates that demand the highest, for instance, right? But he's responsible for kind of building the engineering team, right? And tech team, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I couldn't sit and do that myself at this point right because yeah. we just have too many people right i mean we're we're getting close to 100 people here right uh and yeah. you know, just last month we had 11 new starters right um wow so with that case you know i i you know i wouldn't be able to do this by myself right so we really need to like make sure you have a team uh that you can trust that uh you know are the best you can get that are willing to to you know, do what it takes to to build what we need to do right that's fantastic growth. I mean, 100 people within the last five years, right? You've grown absolutely rapidly. And I guess, you know, one question I haven't asked before I go into the next couple of things that, which I really want to ask about is the product itself. What is the product? So, Damantha, I'm going to ask you, can you tell us, just as a short summary, what is the product that you built? So, just very shortly, I would say it's the next generation of project management software. Uh, so we're trying to take the, uh, the history and the evolution of all the project management software that you might have seen in the past uh, uh, and, and move it to the next level. And a big part of that is uh, adding intelligence to the way that we work. So there's a lot of mundane tasks that you might need to do as a project manager in terms of you know, allocating resources, following up on tasks, are we going to meet our deadlines or not? Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do is uh, eliminate a lot of the mundane tasks so that project managers can can focus on the thing that's actually really important when it comes to, uh, to project delivery, which is how is your team working, right? Mm -hmm. How are the people working? It's something that uh, tools and computers can't replace. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's a sense of like, is 
is developer X happy, right? Is he fighting with his wife at home, which means that he's calling the book all the time, right? Yeah. It's the kind of stuff that doesn't uh, that that doesn't appear in a Gantt chart, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it's only through closeness of relations that you can that you can actually figure that out, right? Yeah. So yeah. we want to give uh, we want to give back the time. Uh, to, to project managers and leaders to spend time with their people and allow uh, computers to do the things that, that that they can do, which is crunch the numbers, uh, show projections, look at the statistics. Uh, okay. So that's what we're trying to focus on. Fantastic. And so I've seen, I mean, I was involved, uh, Dennis, with you when you launched in London, uh, when you set up your entity here. And I know that, you know, we've worked together in uh, over the past 18 months or so. But... Um, You've, I've seen that you're looking for world domination, right? <laughs> so I want to ask you a little bit about that. What is world domination for you? You're expanding. You've obviously won this recent uh, round. So I want to ask you a little bit about that, you know, your experiences with the latest funding round. And, and what does world domination mean to you? So when you say world domination, it sounds so brutal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean it in the nicest possible way, of course. <laughs> um, no, so, so while we're... We're trying to do is we we're we're an ambitious uh, bunch of people here, right? And we try to hire ambitious people that, that want to make a, make a mark on on you know on the space that we're that we're in, right? Um, so for us, it's really about you know proving to the market that you know we have a, a very you know good solid offering, right? That can compete with you know vendors that have been out there for you know 20 and 30 years, right? And we're already now at this point, right, at a state where we you know consistently win against these guys. When we when we meet customers, right, uh, and we just want more of that, right. Um, so so we have now uh, an office in Copenhagen, um, an office here in London, and then uh, a building an office in, in the U.S. as well, right. Mm-hmm. So, so for me, the next big step is is really to win the U.S. market uh, at a, at an even higher clip rate than what we're doing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, so really, just you know, we want to get to that, you know, be in the Gartner quadrant, right. That's you know, yeah. we want to get there, right. As as an example. Um, really want to be taken serious as, as a company and, and as a product and and as an enduring company, I'd say, right? Yeah, very interesting. And so what is your end goal, uh, Dennis? I mean, what's your exit strategy? What are you looking to achieve in this company? So we have a, we have a pretty ambitious plan. So we want our IPO in, in 2026, uh, mm-hmm. ideally, is, is the ambition here, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's, you know, pretty, you know, I'd say aggressive, but, you know, we've built a solid plan to get there. Uh, and have a good kind of credible plan to get there, which is important. And you know, now it's just a matter of finding the people that can help us get there, right? So, so we can't do that without more hiring. Uh, and the company needs to grow, uh, not necessarily for the fact that it's growing, but because that you know we're we're seeing so much intake from new customers that are coming to us because they just love the product. Um, mm-hmm. and, and and customers that join us very rarely leave us because mm-hmm. the, the the product we're building is very solid, right? So for me, it's always been a personal. Um, you know, high importance that we build something that people like to use and that they that really solves the pain point for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not a big believer in, you know, selling by PowerPoint and then when you get the product in your hands, it's a little mm-hmm. bit subpar, right? Uh, it's really important to me that we build something that that's good, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. So no, brilliant. Of, um, of out there. Excellent. So the other question I've got, I, uh, and I guess it wouldn't be right for me not to ask this question. We've gone through COVID, we've gone through a pandemic, people have been locked down in their homes. You're growing a business that's now 100 people. You're winning funding rounds, right? You're gro- uh, expanding globally. You also have a very young family. So how do you manage your time? Uh, that is that is uh, one of the bigger challenges in life, obviously, is making sure that you spend the time uh, you need to make this work, but at the same time, make sure that, you know, you, know, you come home and you know read a bedtime story for the kids uh, and and don't really you know come home when they're when it's already too late right yeah so yeah. I've talked to a lot of people who have regretted a lot of things they've done regarding their kids in life you know mm-hmm. definitely don't want don't want to repeat any of those mistakes but it, no, but absolutely. it's absolutely yeah, no, that's why I think it's one of the most important things now in this world where we kind of post-COVID, well, I'll say post-COVID world, but actually I'm bored of saying post-COVID now, but I think it should always have been there, this human interaction of the family, the importance of your children, the importance of being able to bring more impact into your personal life as well as your business life um, and to have a balance from it, I guess. So, Devankar, I'm just going to uh, ask you one last question. What is getting you most excited about your journey and about where Forecast is going? 
So I think what's most exciting to me is is what I spoke to, uh, what I said a little bit earlier about with respect to uh, the intelligence, right, and actually uh, removing a lot of the mundane tasks, right. Mm-hmm. And as I said, this uh, uh, this product is uh, the domain is near and dear to my heart because it's the problems that I've struggled with for the last you know twenty some odd years since I've been leading software projects, right. It's how to keep and get an overview of everything. Right. Um, and and make sure all these moving parts right are, are, are working as smoothly as possible mm-hmm. um, so it's it's something that I would use mm-hmm. right and I think that that's that's the thing that I really really of like course. about this is that I can see that I, that it solves the problems that I have and I know that it'll be a, a, a uh, of great benefit to a, to a lot of people out there and I think that that will kind of drives me right mm-hmm. is because I can see the the, the, the purpose of this right and I can see yeah. that it can actually uh, have a big impact and I think it's the it's what what I'm most interested in is having as big and broad an impact on people's lives as possible I think that, that would, that's what makes a meaningful job and I think I can do that here because I, I know the stress that that you're under when you're leading projects right and, mm-hmm. and I want what I can to help with that right and I think we can do that with yeah. So that's the sort of sort of underlying motivation for me to make yeah. this. Yeah, fantastic. So I'm going to ask you both just one final question, just your, a summary of what your thoughts are. Um, so Dennis, I'm going to ask you, you're um, rapidly expanding into other countries and yeah. you are, so obviously you mentioned earlier there's a steep learning curve. If for people who are listening, people who are kind of inspired by your journey and probably at the same stage as your journey, are there any sort of top tips you can give people um, from your own experiences as to what they should think about when they're at this juncture? <laughs> that can be a very long, uh, long <laughs> <answer>. <laughs> um, So I think, I think the main thing is to kind of think about what you want to do in your career. And if we're talking about like startups, um, you know, what, what, what can you do that makes, makes you credible um, in, in terms of what you're building, right? Um, so, so, you know, if you want to build something good, you need to understand the domain pretty deeply. Otherwise, you end up building something that's going to be superficial. And if you do that, it, it, it doesn't really typically, it's going to matter a lot, right? Um, so I'd say that's, that's probably my main point. And then, then the other one, as I said before, I think it's, it's thinking about like from a career perspective, what do you want to do and make sure that there's kind of a red thread in, mm-hmm. in what you want to achieve, right? So that's what we look for in, in the people we're hiring. And, you know, we have, I think, 30 odd open jobs right now across mm-hmm. our three years, right? Um, and really looking for like people that have a red thread, uh, ambitious and driven and want to kind of make a difference, right? I think that's yeah. the most Fantastic. And Damantha, um, just asking you on your final words on funding, because so many companies go for funding and you've been successful multiple times as a business in securing funding. What are your top tips for people who are at that stage of trying to get funding? How, what makes it successful? I think, uh, yeah, you need to stand out in some ways, right? And you, you need to be able to articulate your value proposition, right? I think, and yeah. be able to articulate a plan for getting there, right? Um, so I think there's a saying, you know, that ideas are cheap. It's execution that that matters, right? So I think uh, I think it's great to have a good idea, but you need to show how you're going to get there. I think as well. Right? Yeah. I think that that's that's the important thing, and and, and know your numbers, right? I think uh, make sure that you know that the numbers add up to be able to support what it is that you think you want to do, right? Because there's a lot of people out there with great ideas, right? And it's the ones that actually execute. Yeah. Are, those are the ones that win. No, absolutely. Fantastic tips, guys. And I really appreciate you both being on the show today and taking the time out to talk to us. I think it's very inspiring the journey that you've started and that you're on and even more inspiring that you are actually expanding globally so fast at a rapid pace. And I hope that we can certainly be part of that journey and see you in a few years time and see where you've got to. But thank you again. And uh, hopefully we'll be in touch. Thank you. back. Uh, thanks so much uh, for joining us. I think we're just working out a small technical uh, issue here. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for being a part. Asma, amazing interview again. Uh, there we go. All right. Let's uh, get to that. Sorry. We just, 
We're adjust, adjusting ourselves, are we? Yeah, yeah. We, we lost the TV for, for a minute there, so we couldn't see where we were sitting. But thank, thank you so much. Oh, uh, for sitting, joining sitting on my lap there, Zane. Um, yeah. it's, it's better I than I missed you. I missed you. It's, it's, been, it's been a while yeah. since I've seen you. Yeah, it's good to have Zane back <laughs> as, as well this week, back off holiday. Um, how, how did you find Greece? And, and I guess you're one of the first ones of us to travel internationally at the moment. It's great to be back. Um, Greece was amazing. I hadn't been anywhere for 18 months. And I think, you know, a lot of people have been stressing about traveling. I was quite stressed before I about, you know, how's this going to work? What are the processes? But it's actually very smooth. I mean, there was a lot of admin involved, um, but it's great to be back. And Greece is fully open. Um, it's good to see tourism back for the economy and whatnot. But no, it's brilliant. Excellent. So, um, yeah, it's good It's good to have the three of us back. Uh, we're excited for another uh, episode of the Great Country Debate. Um, so, Raj, I don't know if you had any thoughts there on forecasts. I, I think, for me, I found that quite sort of aggressive global scaling plans heading to an IPO was uh, the highlight for me. I, th I think that's definitely what you want to see in a company. Yeah, just just a few a few pointers that I picked up from from both of them. All, always great to to chat to or to to hear from guys who are actually busy doing it. It's not a theoretical exercise; they're actually doing it. So interesting, he was saying that you know try to not take funding, but you get to a point where if you really want to move fast, then you you have to get that funding to kind of go there. Um, you know, with what Devanka was saying about the fact that at the scale that they are, the CTO now becomes, it's about the team, and it's about managing all of that. And then the other thing that I thought was really clever is the fact that their product itself is of using technology to allow you to focus on the more humani the humanity. So it's, it's crunching the boring and mundane jobs and allowing you to at least then focus on the people, um, uh, the, the people side of things. Yeah, I think there are a lot of great takeaways from that. Um, and you know, as you just said, the fact that they were originally opposed to funding, but then you get to a point, and I think now when you're developing any technology, um, you kind of get to that point where if you do want to scale quickly, it takes a lot of funds, a lot of money. And so as much as you may initially want to kind of keep it organic, you do get to that point where you have to go for it. And the fact that they've got this whole time scale mapped out, as Ben was saying, you know, with the IPO 2026, I mean, it's very clear structure. But then again, you've got that human element as well. And I like the fact that Dennis was saying how the idea came from the fact that in his previous company that he was working as an employee for, you know, he saw some of the challenges working with spreadsheets, the difficulties and all the different processes. And it's all these little things where your experiences are what triggers you. A lot of people today think, oh, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to do it from day one. And if you've got a great idea, then that's brilliant. But often, you know, it's when you have other experiences, that's when you get those ideas and those sparks that can result in a great business. Yeah. Again, an another great interview. So, I mean, at some point, I, I imagine we'll trip up, um, but we'll, we'll keep the ball rolling, knock, knock on wood as we go forward. So, I mean, without further ado, at the moment, I believe in terms of the great country debate, we are all tied up one apiece. So today is the, the great tiebreaker. Um, we, we've got three great countries from Europe here today, and we're going to mix things up a little bit. Well, not mix it up crazy. We haven't been the greatest at sticking to our time limit. So if this, <laughs> if this is we. the first episode... Did you say we? I said we, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if this is your first episode tuning in, um, we have a great country debate segment where Suraj, Zain and I each pick a country from a different region and just try and uh, pitch for that to be the country expanding into. We look at some of the benefits, um, some of the cons to moving in that country, and then you get to vote live on where you think is the best country to do business. We're meant to keep it to 90 seconds, a minute 30. Haven't been great at that. So we're going to add a timer uh, up here. There we go. There we go. The magic of, uh, of technology. Um, and then so you lose I don't know, 10 points um, for going over time. I don't know if we have a point system, but that's what we're going with. Um, so yeah, what countries, uh, well, I'll start off today. I'm covering up Portugal. I'm covering Greece since I just got back from that. Topical. Siraj, where are you and going? And I, Espanol. I'm in Spain, yeah. Fantastic. Do, do you want me to kick off first? Um, we'll, we'll, we'll test this. So, so someone give me a, a three second countdown and then we'll, we'll see how I do. All right, three, three. two, <laughs> One, go. 
Fantastic. Portugal is one of the best places to set up a business in Europe. It's ranked in the top five safest countries in the world. It's ranked 39 out of 190 economies in terms of ease of doing business, which is actually really quite high. It's also ranked third on the Global Peace Index and ranked very highly for human on the Human Development Index. So there's a lot of benefits going on for the country. Just from a business perspective, same time zone as London. Doing business in Portugal also opens up the entire EU to you, um, so you can freely trade between borders and, and ports, and opening up the EU is 23% of the global GDP you're giving yourself access to. So if you're coming to Europe, Portugal is the place to do it. It takes less than a week to set up, fastest in Europe. Um, corporate tax rate is only 5%, and there's a number of tax treaties, meaning that citizens don't get tub, um, can avoid double taxation. Um, there's a lot of incentives to attract foreign investment into companies as well. There's special investments on separate um, different segments as well. So if you're doing anything that impacts tourism, science, and the environment, there's special incentives. Um, setting up in Portugal, you can also for, go for the Global Resident Permit, which allows individuals to enter any country in the Shenzhen region, which is a lot. They have a really great workforce there, cheaper than pretty much anywhere else in Europe. Um, so tax incentives, young knowledgeable workforce, and a gateway to Europe. Why would you not go to Portugal? Woo, that was pretty close, nice. pretty close. That was good. Dips in under the line, yeah. I like that. Yeah. First time you've been on that. There we go, there we go. Um, Should we go Siraj next? next? You've got the Siraj and Okay, Spain. already. The, yeah. I must admit, oh. the clock does add an extra, an extra zing to this, doesn't it? it All right. No, it does, that right? Was... I'll give you a countdown. Three, okay. two, one. Buenos dias, everyone. <laughs> um, Spain, we're talking about Spain, and um, it's the 14th largest um, economy in the world. It's the fifth largest tourist destination, and I'll, and I'll, I'll tell you why I, I want to mention that. Um, from a setup point of view, really easy. You only need one director. They don't have to be, they can, that person can be a foreigner. It takes you, th costs you 3,000 euros to set up. It takes you about one month to, to, to set up. And you don't have to go to the country. The economy, really low um, inflation over the last couple of years. Since 2010, it's been under 2%. Um, employment has been, oh, unemployment has been decreasing for the, um, since, by 10% over the last couple of years. It is the 17th best um, exporter when it comes to exporting uh, um, from, from where it is. The biggest countries that they export are France, Germany, and Portugal, which are great. There are over 20 million um, in domestic market. So the domestic market by itself is big, very affluent. Plus, there are 83 million tourists every year. And if you add that together, it's a huge domestic market, let alone the access to the rest of um, the EU, but also from the position down to Africa and even South America. Um, it's, it's really, it's the, it's the center of innovation. 75% of the businesses are service generated and it's a beautiful place to be that, what more can I say? <laughs> hey, hang on, Zero. Well we've done. In, we've in. Yeah, congratulations. I thought you were stalling there at, at the start for the first few seconds, uh, but you came in perfectly. Well, well done. So, all right. Thank you. No, no pressure, Zane, but uh, I think that's two of us in, in the right time zone pocket. Um, so, we'll give you a countdown. Greece in three, two, one. Which one single country can be classed as the home of democracy, political science, and Western philosophy? None other than Greece. Now, obviously, it's had its challenges in the past recent years, you know, financial crisis in 2009. However, it's come back, it's made a comeback. And in the words of Adonis Georgiadis, who is the Greek Minister for Development and Investment, uh, all foreign investors have made money in Greece. If you want to make money, go to Greece. Um, and historically, it's been known for its bureaucracy, but since 2019, the new government has made a lot of changes. So there's a new one-stop shop uh, process for setting up a company. There are seven main entity types you can consider, and the simplest one, only you only require one euro of share capital, and the average time to set up is just two days. So in fact, Greece was ranked 11th in the world by World Bank in 2020 for ease of starting up a business. Um, and Pfizer, Cisco, Microsoft, they've all been increasing their activity, setting up in Greece in recent years. If it's good enough for them, it's surely good enough for you. Um, and if we look at the workforce, highly educated, also low labor costs. So if you want to get a good access to high quality talent, but for not the crazy costs you might get in maybe Spain and Portugal, Greece is again the place to be. 
Uh, and if we look at industries, there's a lot, a variety of industries, energy, shipping, food, agriculture, you know, Siraj touched on tourism, Greece has hundreds of islands, massive tourism opportunity there to target that market. And there are so many other things, I've got five seconds to go, Greece is going to grow, it's come back out of lockdown, it's brilliant, vote for Greece. <laughs> <laughs> Highly recommend for a holiday location. Well done, well, well done. That's pretty good. I think it's almost better to have too much and cut yourself off than to, to be falling short. I, I didn't manage to fit mine in. That, that was good. I really enjoyed your opening there, Zane. I, I think if we were broke, breaking it down, you definitely won the opening. Um, I didn't fit in my, my one negative. Did you guys have any negatives for your locations? I'll, I'll, th I'll throw mine out there. All government documents need to be in Portuguese. So if you are setting up a business in Portugal, you will need to translate everything into Portuguese, which we highly advise, obviously, having a partner having someone in your network who can help you do this because it, it is something you have to take into consideration, but collaborating with the right people will make that a smooth process. Yeah, and I think that's something to cheer up and out with. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. there we go. There's a positive spin on the negative. Yeah, you got um, it. I guess with Greece, again, I've touched on it, there's a lot of bureaucracy historically. They are making good ways to change it. There's still a few things that can be done a bit slow, a lot of admin to do. But again, having the right partner can make sure those things go smoothly. Things are happening a lot quicker. The government's making rapid changes. Um, Spain? Uh, look, Spain, Spain, unfortunately, the, co the, the, the cost of employment is, has been increasing quite a bit over the last while. Um, and uh, yeah, the minimum wage increases by 10% every, every year. Um, not, not a bad thing for the people of Spain, but it, uh, the, the actual low, low cost of employment is, isn't as beneficial as in other countries. If I had to vote, I must admit, and sorry, sorry, Ben, but I, Greece uh, came out quite strong today. Yep. He's got the benefit of having some uh, some local knowledge. He went and did, it, did yeah. his research on his holiday. <laughs> I didn't even know I was talking about this this week. I'm just yeah. I'm just trying to get a trip a trip to the next country we're going to feature. So because if he keeps winning because he travelled there, then it's like, oh, oh well, where are we going next? Us. I'll I'll go there. <laughs> That's it. I think we, we, are, we are planning to get to Portugal for Web Summit, so maybe, maybe I should have waited until then. Uh, I could have come back with some real life experience. Um, excellent. Well, yeah, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Hopefully that was valuable. Obviously, there's a lot more European options that we, we can cover in, in some of the um, coming episodes, but we'll jump to some different regions in the future as well. If you've got anything anywhere you'd really like us um, to look at, maybe it's the country you're from and you want to share some advice, you know, email me directly. I'll, I'll take the, uh, the advantage. Um, but yeah, please feel free to, to contribute if you'd like. Um, we've got another amazing episode, obviously, next week, Wednesday, 2 p.m. I think we've got a really good interview on um, then. Yeah, we've got an amazing guest. We won't say the name yet, but it's, well, the company is ENI, which is one of the world's seven super major oil companies, I think that's what they're called, a market cap of 30 billion. So fantastic guest, fantastic company. We'll be talking about how they do business globally. Yeah. Exactly, and that will be Wednesday, 2 p.m. next week. Uh, we'd love to see you back there again. Um, th thank you, obviously, for Gina for joining. We kind of threw her on the spot with the introduction today. Um, thank you to Asma as well for another amazing interview. Uh, we'll see everybody again next week, 2 p.m. on Wednesday on LinkedIn. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.